have for years sang a song with this very title that you read on the screen. There is a great day coming. And as you and I would sing that song, uh, we would sing through those verses about the great day that's coming, the, the good day that's coming, and, and kind of the bad day that's coming. As we read that song and those lyrics, I'm reminded of a great literary work as it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. You know, it depends on your perspective of that day, of how great of a day that will be of how awful a day that would be, or how horrific a day that will be, or how wonderful a day that will be. And it's all really going to be up to you. The judgment of mankind from God is real. No matter what you think about God, whether you believe in Him, whether you're living faithfully obedient unto Him, whether you don't believe in Him, or, or even if you don't really know what to believe in Him. The judgment of mankind is true. And it is coming. It doesn't really matter how you live. That's not going to slow the judgment of God. It doesn't matter if you, if you live... Uh, in faithful obedience unto Him, being a, a model example of a Christian throughout your life, or, or if you decide that I'm going to be the next Jesse James in American history. You're not going to slow down that day of judgment. You're not going to put that day of judgment off. It doesn't matter what you think about it. If, if you think it's fair... If you think it's unfair, if you don't know what to think about it, that, that doesn't matter. It's not going to put it off. It doesn't matter what you have. I might be the, the wealthiest person in the world and have every person on this globe looking at me wishing they were me. Probably not. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if I don't have two nickels to rub together. It's not going to change the fact that judgment's coming. It doesn't matter if I live like a Christian here while I'm here at this building and then live like a heathen outside these walls. It doesn't matter if I am the light of God who, who goes from this building throughout my community and lights it up. It's not going to change the fact that judgment is coming. You know, there are two uh, subjects that Jesus really loved to preach on. If you read through your New Testament, especially the Gospels, you'll find out his favorite subject was money and how we misuse that. Second favorite um, subject, judgment. You and I need to grasp fully and digest fully the idea that judgment is coming and I must be prepared must be that there's no way around that and the merciful God that has given us the Bible has given us several warnings and here's about one eighth of them throughout the Bible you'll read about impending doom. You'll read in Psalm chapter 1 and verse 5 the judgment that's coming to that wheat and that chaff. You'll read in Amos chapter 5 and verse 24 the judgment that's coming to the nation of Israel. And, and interestingly to us, you'll read in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 7 the judgment that comes to man and Jonah, or rather John chapter 5 and verse 30, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 that we read just a moment ago, 2 Peter 3, 1 John chapter 4, Jude. You'll read in the book of Ecclesiastes that book that was written by the king himself as he refers to himself there as the preacher the last two verses he will write this let us clear uh, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter now when you read something like that in literature and especially in that divine literature here is what god through this pen of this divine writer is saying Listen up, because this is very important. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here's where, it, here's where it all boils down to. Fear God and keep His commandments. 
This is what completes man. This is what fills in that hole. You know, the hole that in the book of Ecclesiastes that, that that writer was trying to fill up, this is what fills it up. As a matter of fact, he says in Acts chapter uh, 17 and verse 30 and 31 that, that at the times of the ignorance of man, God winked at, but now he's looking past that. He's looking past the, the, the sinfulness that man is doing in the point in which God is writing that, and he's looking to that cross and to that blood that's going to flow backward and forward. You see it in 1 Corinthians, you see it in Romans, you see it throughout the entirety of, of the New Testament. God pleading to man to come back to him. Why? Because judgment's coming. On that day of judgment, you, yourself, you, 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 will be asked about your faithfulness. And I'll be asked about mine. Lesser left because I messed with him this morning during our early service. But you know what? I'm never going to be asked about Wendell's faithfulness. And he's not going to be asked about mine. But you can write this down and understand this as a fact. I will be asked about mine. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, we see the, all of humanity there gathering before the throne of God in verse number 31. And he begins to ask them about what they did and why they did those things. And he said, you get to enter into rest because you gave me uh, clothes when I needed it. You fed me when I needed it. You, you gave me water when I needed it. And that faithful group is going to say, when did we ever see that? He's going to look at that unfaithful group and he's going to say you can depart into outer wickedness or outer punishment, uh, verse number 46, because when I was hungry, you didn't give me anything or, or when I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything or when I needed clothing, you didn't give me that. And they're going to say the exact same thing. When did we ever see that? There are two groups of people here found in Matthew chapter 25, uh, according to Jesus, and that's people who see needs and people who don't. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 27, you'll see Jesus speaking to those people and, and have those people on that final day say, Lord, Lord, did, did we not in your name prophesy? Did we not? And he'd say, depart from me. The phrase, depart from me, must be the most terrifying phrase found within the Bible. Notice what he's saying there when he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Remove yourself from my sight and from where I am. And you have now been banished into a place I will never be. The sobering thought there, though those words heard ringing throughout the ears of men and women through eternity, must be terrifying. And the fact about judgment is I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give an answer for the things that I do. And so, because all of those things are true, let me ask you a few things that will help you get to the right side of judgment. That side in which uh, you can stand before God and, and almost be elated, be, be happy, be joyful. Hear these words, well done. First, do you know God? Not, do you know of God? Not do you know what society says about God or what someone has told you about God. I mean, do you know God? And the only way to know Him is to open His book and to read about Him. Let me tell you something you may or may not know about God. First mention of God found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 refers to him as Elohim. And from that particular point, uh, you can see that it is a multiplicity because of the idea of, of the word being a plurality. But here's what else you'll see. You go through, take this as your homework this week. Go through the Bible and see if you can find 
his name. See, what, when you walk up to preachers like me or Michael and you want to address us, you say, hey, Billy, or hey, Michael. That's, that's our names. Everything from the very first mention of God, Elohim, the self-existent one, Everything you read about God is always a description of Him. Hmm. All-powerful, almighty, self-existent, omnipresent. This God, you know Him. I don't even want you to know His name. Do you know who He is? Do you know how much He cares for you? Just for you. This is the God that, that wants to reestablish a relationship with all of mankind, but especially you. This is the one who finds himself walking in the cool of the evening in Genesis chapter 3, only to ask Adam and Eve, where are you? Not as if he didn't know where they are because he knows everything. It's not a question of where they are physically. It's the same question he asks mankind even today. Where are you? At one point in time, you were right here beside me. Now where are you? Do you know God? Do you know that God who is the provider? Do you know that God who is the, the planner for mankind? Speaking of plans, do you know His plan? Do you know what He intends for mankind? Do you know that he intends for, for you and me to follow after him and to put ourselves in subjection to him? Do you know he's the only one who has the right to tell me what to do? Sometimes we look at his plan and we don't like it. And sometimes we don't like it because I don't really want somebody to tell me what to do, do I? No. Do you? Not really. But when you and I understand who God is, and we understand what His plan is for, then we readily accept Him telling me what to do. Why? Because He is the source of righteousness, holiness, goodness. And we see Him. And what He has planned for us. And that plan involves sacrificing his son. I have daughters. You know where we are. I have daughters. And if I'm going to be real honest with you, I'm not going to give you one of those either. I don't think I would give you my son. But yet it is the plan of God who gives of everything that he has for me. He's willing to give up his son just to repair a relationship with me? <laughs> Why me? Why you? When you and I read and look at the Old Testament and that system that was given unto Moses through, or through Moses unto the nation of Israel, we see a, a, a series of laws that, that, that the nation of Israel would keep. We see one that would keep them close to God. We also see in Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 through 29, or 27 through 29, how that old law was a schoolmaster, or, or what you and I would think of as a, as a bus to take us to school where truth is. There was a fatal flaw in the Old Testament. And the flaw is this, and it was built in from the very beginning, God knowing this, that Old Testament doing exactly what it should. The flaw is in the sacrifice. Jonathan, how many goat and bulls are you worth? What if we were to stack them up and we were to put Jonathan right beside it? How much is he worth? You stack them all up. He's still not worth that. He's worth much more than that. 
The sacrifice from the New Testament is Jesus the Christ, that pure and holy and righteous and sinless man for sinful mankind. And that was the plan from all eternity. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10, uh, 8 through 10. You and I see that and we see the sacrifice of Jesus the Christ. We see how much God loved us and, and how much He planned for us. And we understand exactly what those things mean or as much as we can. But did you know that salvation from God it's really only for those who know the difference between right and wrong. We take our beautiful little children and we divide them by age. In my mind, I was thinking we divide them up, but that would be that way instead of this way. We don't want to divide them that way. That's no good. We divide them up into ages. We put them in classrooms. And then we begin to teach them about God's law and God's plan and what God uh, expects from us. And, and then one day they come to us at a, at a young age and they say, I think I'd like to be baptized. Then comes the difficult portion to figure out as an adult, do they understand right from wrong? Because what they can do is they can recite the facts to you from the Bible that mankind has to hear and believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That's great. Let me give you a glimpse of what I like to do. Especially if they're young. I say, I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about that. Maybe one day you'd like to go to high school, right? Yeah, 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 I think I would. Good, good. Well, what are you going to do after high school? Well, I'm going to be, uh, whatever, a doctor, a lawyer, Indian chief. Okay, good deal. Great. You go to college for that? Yes, yes, yes. Then at, you'll probably want to have a family, right? Yes, yes. Maybe some kids? Sure, sure. You want to do that today? No, no. It's great that our children are thinking about those things, but until they understand right from wrong, you can't baptize them for the remission of their sins. Because until they understand right from wrong, they're not convicted of those sins. Sorry. That's what the Bible says. But it's great that they're thinking of those things. Do you know what right from wrong is? Do you know about the sacrifice of Jesus the Christ? Do you know about his plan for mankind? Do you know who God is? Did you know that God's plan, Jesus' sacrifice, and my faith are not based on some little warm, fuzzy feeling I have inside? Do you know that? Sometimes that warm, fuzzy feeling that you have inside is bad tacos. How do you know the difference? Well, let me say this. It is altogether appropriate and it is altogether wonderful that you and I have emotions inside us about the plan from God and Jesus' sacrifice and our faith to God. That's altogether fine and appropriate. But when we begin to make our decisions based on emotion only, we can find ourselves in a world of hurt. Do you know God? Do you know His plan? Do you know His sacrifice of His own Son? Do you know right from wrong? Do you know about your faith and God's plan and, and Jesus' sacrifice not just being something on the inside, but something that is projected out? Oh, it starts here. It, it, it resides here, but it's projected out for all men everywhere to be see, to see. Did you not know Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, you need to learn how to be salt in a, in a tasteless world? You know, I know Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, you're supposed to be light into a world that's full of darkness. Did you know then that every sin that's committed by mankind from Adam forward has been a sin against God? Look at Genesis chapter 37. Look at a, the life, a snippet of the life of a man by the name of Joseph. In, in Genesis 37, we find Joseph in the house of Potiphar. And you and I know this particular account in his life. And, and he one day finds himself in that house alone with her. 
And that's not really somewhere he wanted to be. As she had been seducing him and seducing him and seducing him, and now she's got him, now she's got him hemmed up. She grabs him by, the, by the, the coat, and he runs off and leaves that coat, and then she lies about him. She asked him one final time before she grabbed that coat. Come to this bed and lie with me. And he said, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? Right? Is that what he said? All right, y'all are looking at me very intently. Is that what he said? He could have, though. Wasn't it a sin against Potiphar? Yeah. He could have said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against you as Potiphar's wife? You're, you're not my wife. He, he could have said that. That would have been appropriate. He could have even said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against myself? Uh, that would have been true. But that's not what he said. What he said was, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph knew something that you and I need to firmly uh, implant in our minds so that we can understand the gravity of sin. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God who has given me everything? Sometimes we think, well, nobody can see, or I didn't get caught. As if that's something worth bragging about. Do you know those sins are sins against God? Do you know right from wrong? Do you know about faith? Do you know about God's plan and sacrifice of Jesus the Christ? And do you understand that with all those things being said that the wrath of God must be appeased? Turn over to Isaiah 59, or 53 rather, in verse number 12. Isaiah 53 in verse number 12, I, Every time I read this particular verse uh, in the context of Isaiah 53, I guess I came in with a bias and with prejudice, and I, I would look at the words and I would read them and, and not ever really grasp the idea. Don't be foolish like I am. And he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He, God, will see the travail, the, the, the pain and the anguish and the excruciating agony of Jesus on that cross. Now, here's where I mess up. Are you ready? Don't mess up right here. And I would read and be satisfied as if God would look at His Son on that cross and be happy about it. As if He would look at that and think, that's exactly where I wanted Him. That's, uh, well, uh, you, you got what you deserved. And that's so wrong. That's, that's such, that's just so wrong. Let's read it this way. And He, God, shall see the travail and the pain and the anguish of Jesus on that cross, and His wrath for sin will be satisfied. He's paid that price. So I don't have to pay that price. He shall see his travail and his, his wrath will be satisfied. One more question. Do you know that doing anything more or less than what God's Word says has you Choosing your eternal destination as being hell. And I word it that way because I want you to know that you have the opportunity right now to decide eternally where you'll live. See, when we think of judgment, we think of, of punishment and scariness and awfulness, and, and it can be that. And for, for most of humanity who will not fall in line with what God says, it, it will be that. But it does not have to be that. 
It does not have to, to end that way. You can change eternity now. You do not have to choose hell for yourself. You can choose heaven. You can choose an eternity with God in His home if you would. Look at that, that last line there. Would you be willing to sign the contract on the bottom line there that says, I am ready to meet God on that great day. Just, just as you are right now, I am ready to meet God and receive a reward in heaven. If that's you, let me say to you right now, keep going, brother or sister. Keep going. That's exactly the path you need to be walking down. And thank you for the encouragement. But if you're not willing to sign that line just yet, it's quite possibly because you know either you haven't done what God has said or you're not living that way. But once again, Within my hand, I hold the gospel. Gospel meaning good news, and I have some great news for you. You don't have to stay there. If you've never put on Christ in baptism, that's what you need to do. You need to repent of your sin, confess that Jesus is the Christ, and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins being added to the church today then you can sign your name on that line. I'm ready to meet God and receive a reward of heaven. If you've done those things and yet you still look at that line and you say, I don't know about signing that. Maybe it's because you haven't kept your word to him. You know, when, you, when a man puts on Christ in baptism, he vows to God to live a life faithful unto Him in service. Maybe you just haven't done that. I've got great news for you, brother or sister. Why don't you come back home to a God that misses you, to a, to a family that loves you, why don't you feel better about yourself and, and make your eternity sure? And then you can sign your name on that bottom line. And then you know that when you stand before God, it will be a great day. As you will hear, enter into the joys of thy reward. Please don't be caught thinking, I've got enough time. The downfall of so many has to have heard the truth, hear what God would have him do, and understand those things and say, I've got time. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. If you're subject to heaven's invitation, let me invite you to come on down while we stand and while we sing for your encouragement.
Especially want to say thank you for participating with us, with us in this worship, and we pray that it's been as edifying for you as it is encouraging to us. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being with us, and we pray that if you're from the area that you would continue to worship with us. If you are passing through, we pray that your travels are safe. If you, Jim, cards. They're in the foyer to be signed for uh, the, uh, help me out. Do what? Visitation, Visitation group, thank you. <laughs> I need a nap. Um, they're in the foyer, please sign them. Uh, we have a lot of folks that are shut in and those that are suffering um, throughout well, for a number of circumstances that need our encouragement. This is Miss in Prayer. Bow with me, please. Our God and our Father, we humbly come before you so thankful, Lord, for your love for us, for your willingness to be patient with us, to give us a pathway to salvation. Lord, we're so thankful for that gift. We're thankful that we've been able to assemble as your saints today to worship you, to praise your name, to give back to you a portion of what you've given, blessed us with so richly, to remember the sacrifice of your son, Lord, and to open up the bread of life and study from your word. Lord, we have... Many of our congregation, our family, and our friends that are suffering during these times in so many different ways, Lord, we pray that you would watch over them, that you would care for them. We pray that we would be diligent in seeking them out and lending them service wherever we can. Lord, we especially pray for those that are hurting spiritually. We pray, Lord, that their pain may be eased, that they would come to know and to love you, and that they would have the faith in you to, that would carry them all the days of their lives. And Lord, we pray that we would continually look to strengthen and encourage one another and spur one another on to greater faithfulness and greater righteousness towards you. Lord, as we leave this place, we pray that we would go into the world as your lights, that we would have the courage to carry your name and your, your message with us, that we would have the wisdom to exercise our lives in a way that you have commanded us. And we ask, Lord, for the humility to correct ourselves according to your word. Forgive us, we sin, O Lord, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 